Dear students, in the last class, we have learnt about catalyst, catalysis and the theories of catalyst. Today, we are going to discuss about the most important part of catalysts which are helping us in everyday life. In the introductory class, I told you, chemistry is everywhere. Yes, dear students. Today we are going to talk about enzyme catalysis. Yes. Catalysts are substances that speed chemical reactions without being used up in those reactions. In cells, catalysts are usually large globular proteins known as enzymes. There is a portion of an enzyme, its active site, that binds only to a particular molecule, its substrate. The substrate is a participant in the reaction catalyzed by the enzyme. The binding of substrate to enzyme causes a change in the shape of the enzyme, which in turn facilitates the forming or breaking of bonds by the substrate. The product of the reaction is released, and the enzyme is available once again. Because of the fit between substrate and active site, each enzyme is specific for a particular reaction. What are enzymes? Enzymes are catalysts living inside our body. They are biological molecules made up of three-dimensional complex protein network. They do the job of converting whatever food we eat into energy. Today morning, you would have taken breakfast, maybe you play chapati, dosa, whatever it may be. That is munched and broken into pieces by your mouth and the salivary glands will make them further converted and they will send them into the intestine. Their the peptic juice will break them further into smaller molecules by the process of digestion. After that what happens? The starch molecule final composition is further broken down into maltose by a catalyst available inside your body that is the enzyme called as diastase. Do you know the formula of starch? Let me tell you. C6H10O5 N time this is starch molecule. In the presence of water that gets converted into maltose C12H10CO11 N times. This process is done by an enzyme called as a diastase. Further, this maltose by the process of hydrolysis gets converted into glucose with the formula C6H12O6. How this molecule is very familiar to you. What happened to this glucose? There is one more enzyme called as a zymase will convert this glucose further into ethyl alcohol C2H5OH. That again gets converted into acetic, into acetic acid by an enzyme called as a mycoderma acetic. Then you know boys, we get energy since it's an exothermic reaction. With that we work, we run, we walk, we play, all that happens. Along with that, we exhale carbon dioxide these molecules will break down to give carbon dioxide and then water as a final residue. We exhale carbon dioxide and water com comes out in the form of sweat and then urine. So, we have to link now chemistry with the life. 
That's it. So the catalysts which are available inside our body are called as enzymes. Is the duty of enzyme stops here? No. Enzymes are useful in different fields. Before going further into those areas, uh, let us discuss the mechanism of uh, enzyme catalysis. How do they work inside our body? Particularly, we learned in um, our intermediate compound formation theory. In intermediate compound formation theory, the catalyst will form an intermediate that is activated complex with one of the reactant. The substrate binds to a specific region of the enzyme called the active site. These active sites are associated with the functional groups such as amines, carboxylic acid, hydroxide and thiol. The binding of the substrate to the active site of an enzyme is a very specific interaction. Also, the shape of the active site of an enzyme is such that only a specific substrate can fit into it. Just as only a particular key can fit into a specific lock, only a specific substrate can fit into a particular enzyme. Hence, the mechanism is known as the lock and key mechanism. This specific binding leads to the formation of an enzyme substrate complex. When bound to the active site, the substrate is converted into the product. Further, as the product molecules do not have any affinity for the enzyme surface, they leave the enzyme surface immediately. Thus, an enzyme-catalyzed reaction can be illustrated in two steps. The first step involves the formation of the activated enzyme substrate complex. The second step is the decomposition of this activated enzyme substrate complex to form the products. So the mechanism of enzyme catalysis. Enzymes, as I told you, they are protein, protein molecules. Uh, they have three-dimensional structure and they have uh, particular sites for the action of the reactants. They are called as the active sites. With the active sites, uh, the substrate molecules will go and uh, get attached themselves. Substrate, I mean to say, they are called as the uh, reactants. Once they go and join to the surface of the enzyme catalyst, they get convertible into an intermediate. This is called as activated state, in between state. That, since the reactant molecules are now closer, they will react and form the required product. Then the enzyme and the product will get detached. Now it is the duty of the enzyme, since it is free, it is ready now to join with the one more substrate and now again the same process will catch. Now you could have uh, understood how come enzymes can continuously react with the new new reactant to form different products. This is how an enzyme works inside our body. Now, what are the characteristics of enzymes? These enzymes are very efficient and effective. That's the first uh, characteristics. Let us discuss one by one. Enzyme catalysis. What are the characteristics? 
the first characteristics the first characteristics of enzymes they are effective and efficient what is the meaning of effective and efficient if a catalyst like an enzyme is added or inside of the body a million reactant it can convert in minute minute time a minute time now you may know the importance of the catalyst like enzymes very fast they will convert it and effectively they will do the job that's why they are called as effective and efficient the next one is they are highly specific in action you have to use a particular catalyst for a particular reaction for example if you want to convert urea you know very well urea is a very important oil molecule that is having this formula and on hydrolysis process urea will get converted into nh3 and co this process is done by an enzyme called as urease if you use any other enzyme then urease this conversion is not possible that is called as specificity of this catalyst and also i told you about uh, efficient effective you can you may ask a question how an enzyme can do such a, a process in a very faster rate the reason is uh, it will reduce the energy of activation the other day we learned that the energy barrier or energy of activation maybe for the process of converting converting hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen this process requires energy of activation nearly 18 kilocalories per mole and by application of an enzyme the process that is energy of activation will get reduced because of this the process of converting reactant into product can be enhanced enzymes speed up chemical reactions remember that in a chemical reaction the reactants interact to form a product The chemical reactants for this example are shown on the left and the products on the right. The wall that separates them represents the activation energy. You can think of this wall as an energy speed bump. The larger the bump, the slower the reaction. The yellow speed bump represents a chemical reaction without an enzyme, and the orange speed bump represents the same reaction with an enzyme. As you can see, the orange speed bump is a lot lower. This is because the enzyme acts to physically bring the reactants together. By doing so, it increases the efficiency of the reaction and lowers the amount of energy needed for the reaction to occur. Since less energy is required, the reaction occurs at a faster rate. Notice that the enzyme does not influence the energy level of the reactants or the products, but only the amount of energy that is required during the process of the chemical reaction. we have to talk about optimum temperature what is optimum temperature any of the chemical reaction we have learnt in chemical kinetics uh, they require a minimum temperature for speeding up the reaction you may ask a question what is the role of temperature in the chemical reaction as you know reactants will be spread out in different directions in different areas and all those reactants have to come closer then only they will collide and form the required products unfortunately if they are far away then the chemical reactivity may be very 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 less probable 
that time if you supply a little bit of heat energy, all those molecules will gain the energy and start moving here and there. There the collision is possible. Because of the collision, product formation is also probable. So for that we have to supply some temperature. The same behavior is applicable for catalyst too. For example, we will explain this with a uh, graph possible. The rate of the chemical reaction I take in y axis and the x axis we go for the temperature, increasing temperature, 10, 20, 30, 40, 30, like that it goes on. At the beginning, when the temperature is very low, the speed of the reaction is also very low. When temperature increases, the rate of the reaction increases. At one particular time, the speed of the reaction reaches the maximum level. So this temperature is referred as the optimum temperature. After reaching an optimum temperature, you keep on supplying heat energy, then the reaction, the catalyst activity will get decreased. Maybe at one point it may reach even zero. So, the importance of optimum temperature in any of the catalytic reaction, enzymatic reaction, we have to learn. So, for, for example, in our body, that is, uh, if you say in uh, degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Celsius is the uh, optimum temperature, that is our normal body temperature. You can say 98.4 degree Fahrenheit. This condition, at this temperature, all the enzymes available in our body work very normally to the maximum level, optimum level. Suppose one, one particular condition will take, maybe somebody is in fever, his body temperature increases. So at this time, when the body temperature increases, the catalytic activity will get decreased. Sometimes if it is not controlled, it may go to zero level also. That's why at home, whenever we are not feeling well, we are feverish, or your mother will uh, suggest you to go for a very lighter food which will digest very easily. Because if you take a very very uh, tough food or a huge quantity of food you take, all these enzymes activity at this temperature will be disturbed. So you may be in a danger. So this is the use of uh, the graph to explain the optimum temperature is required for any catalytic reaction. The next one, we will be learning about what is the influence of optimum pH. I hope boys you may have a clear cut understanding about what is meant by pH. pH is talking about whether the particular substance in acidic condition or in a basic condition or in neutral pH talks about negative block and of H plus ion or hydronium ion. Here, the activity of uh, the catalyst, we talk about the pH range. Maybe we start from 3, 4, 5, 6, it goes on. At a particular pH, the activity of this uh, enzyme will be very high. So that pH uh, we call as uh, optimum pH for this particular reaction. So it is our duty to identify what is that pH. Enzymes have different optimal pHs. For example, this enzyme pepsin, which works in the stomach, actually has an optimal pH that's pretty low, like around a pH of 2, um, which is where the stomach is at, and then it denatures at any lower or any higher than that. Whereas uh, trypsin is an enzyme that uh, functions in other parts of the body. Uh, that
at a closer to neutral pH of 7, whereas if it got as acidic as uh, pepsin could withstand, it would definitely denature. To conclude, enzymes lose their function when they lose their form or shape. And that happens when either the temperature or the pH is not optimal. At those suboptimal temperatures and pHs, enzymes denature and don't speed up chemical reactions. Whereas at optimal temperatures and pHs, they keep their shape and speed them up. A stool that is catalytic poisoning process. And the next one is the activators, or we can talk about the promoters. So what are the yeah, enzyme poisons? And what are the enzyme promoters? Sometimes, the catalytic activity or the enzyme activity can be reduced. You would have seen the recent, recent development in uh, finding out medicine for uh, the coronavirus kill. You can see they are uh, prescribed, the doctors are prescribing uh, hydroxychloroquine. Along with that, some of the doctors are even trying uh, antibacterial drugs also. Because this virus has the ability to go and disturb the lungs and may sometimes uh, cross uh, the limits and also cause the uh, problem of uh, pneumonia. So these infectious diseases, uh, they may reduce the growth of the bacteria. At that time, you can poison their uh, growth uh, by this process of uh, enzyme poisoning, enzyme poisoning. The next thing is activators or promoters. Sometimes by supplying some of the materials, maybe vitamins for our body, they are non-proteinoid components, they will go and enhance the activity of this enzymes available in our body. So, now you can link our catalysis and enzyme catalysis with our everyday life or functioning of our the next topic we have to talk about is zeolite catalysis. What are zeolites? Zero, the term, talks about the boiling stones. Yes, zeolites, which are useful molecules uh, we are going to talk about zeolite catalysis zeolites amazing mineral structures found in nature these microporous crystalline aluminosilicate molecular sieves consist of highly ordered discrete pores and cavities with molecular dimensions making up a crystalline framework this allows for small molecules to pass through while stopping larger molecules useful for the absorption of gases and liquids. And for decades, these microscopic structures have been man-made, produced synthetically, and tailored to industrial process applications. The zeolites or uh, molecules which are naturally available, they are microporous, crystalline, hydrated molecules. That means they have a lot of pores. You can uh, link these molecules like sponge, and they they have pores in it, and through the pores the molecules can go and come back, and a lot of reactivity is uh, possible. And what are these molecules? What is the chemistry of these uh, zeolites? Some fifty of the zeolites are naturally available. The one fifty of them are synthetically prepared. They are aluminosilicate structures. You would have seen the element uh, aluminum, atomic number 13, has an outer electron configuration of the three electron structure. Similarly, silicon, if you say, it has uh, 2, 8, 4. So, silicon has four electrons and aluminum has three electrons. These zeolites or aluminosilicate structures where tetrahedrons of silicon and aluminum will 
have the combination. In this case you can see there is a difference in number of electrons that means there is one negative charge extra because of the electron available in the silicon. So when these things will form a structure and extra electron is available that valency is filled by either H plus ion or Na plus ion. So when H plus ion is uh, available in a zeolite, then we call them as uh, acid zeolite or the acid catalyst. Suppose an Na plus is available, then we talk about the basic. Now what is the advantage of zeolites? We know this uh, for the purification of water and then softening of water. We talk about zeolite technology and, uh, and very importantly we talk about uh, preparation of uh, um, gasoline, petrol, diesel or we can say fractionating the petroleum into different fragments, uh, zeolites are most useful. That means since zeolites are uh, having small small pores, holes, the, the, through the holes and pores you send the petroleum uh, molecules uh, they will break down according to the size of the pores available into different fragments. This we will be seeing in a video. There you can see these H plus ions will be replaced in the place and in, in the case of uh, Na plus they are called as a basic catalysis process. And now you will have to understand a few things about the zeolites, why zeolites are very very uh, special and they are useful compound. So three of the main areas we have to learn, what are they? Zeolites have a, a, react, a reactant selectivity. And zeolites have transition state selectivity. And zeolites have a, Product selectivity. What is the reactant selectivity? A particular zeolite, depending upon the pore size available, can invite only a particular size to reactant and that will go and replace the H plus ion. Thereby, the size decides which type of uh, reactant can enter into the gate of uh, zeolites. Unwanted molecules, uh, uh, bigger molecules cannot enter through the pores. So that is the first advantage. The second is advantage is transition state selectivity. What is the original based transition state selectivity? Different uh, reactants will go and sit on to the sites of active sites of the zeolite and go for an intermediate state. That we call it as a transition state. In the transition state, the size of the transition molecule form is bulkier or not required molecule is formed then they will be rejected only the required molecules can be attached to that particular zeolite and the next is the product selectivity sometimes the product form may not be useful for us but unfortunately they will be attached to the zeolite that will be neglected only a smaller the required size molecules can be accepted by the zeolite. So that's why zeolite finds lot of usefulness in your everyday life. The next Chabazites are able to adsorb water molecules from the gas phase up to 30% of their own weight. During adsorption, these water molecules bind to the zeolite surface and emit energy. This technology allows renewable resources, such as solar energy, to be used as efficient sources of heat, for example in heat pumps, to generate heat efficiently with low power consumption. The process is reversible and sustainable. The water molecules can be removed from the zeolite material, so that the process can be repeated as often as required. Dear students, the next area of the use of catalysis is a phase transfer catalysis. 
we can call it in short form as an ETC. In 11th standard, we have learned something about solvent extraction process. It's a method of purifying an organic compound by separating, by usage of the separating final. Yes. There will be two phases, one organic phase, other one as an inorganic phase. Uh, both of them are invisible, they don't mix at all. So with the help of the funnel, separating funnel, we do the process of purifying the organic compound. Imagine a similar situation. There is an organic solvent, a reactant is an organic solvent. There is another inorganic uh, uh, solvent in that another reactant is there. They have to react and form the product. It is literally not possible because both organic and the inorganic phases will be separated and the product formation or reaction or the mixing is not possible at all. And how to do that? There should be an intermediate liquid which is uh, required for making both uh, solvents, uh, both the layers to mix. I can go to a uh, recent example. Chinese president visited Mahabalipuram and uh, our uh, Prime Minister um, and the Chinese president were not able to converse freely during the time one of the person who was working like a mediator because he knew both the Chinese language and the Hindi and English so he can able to make up the situation very very smoothly and it was an historical event for us. So like the same, we are going to find the usage of phase transfer catalysis and one of the solvent or the material catalyst which can mix with the both the sides then only the product formation is possible. The example, best example is the uh, there is the presence of an organic chloride, RCL, that has to react with the NaCl, sodium cyanide. And we are expecting the product that organic alkyl group has to join with or organic group has to join with the cyanide to form RCN and the NaCl has to come out. This is what is the expected outcome product. If you closely see, this particular RCL is an organic case. And the NACL is an aqueous case. And this RCN formed will be in organic case. And this NACL is an aqueous case. So when we are trying to mix this organic phase to RCL with MACN, it is not probable at all. They don't mix, the reaction is not possible. So how to manage this situation? We are seeking the help of a phase transfer catalyst. Who is that? That is nothing but a tetra alkyl ammonium chloride. Look at the molecule carefully. One side it has the combination of organic phase, other side it has the combination of a inorganic phase that can easily join with the aqueous medium. When we supply this, first thing what is going to happen? This will react with the NaCl. Thereby the Cl will leave the place and the cyanide will go and attach with this molecule. So, the new product formed will be R4N plus Cn minus. Now, this will be in the organic phase. Since it is an organic phase, we can very well react with an organic uh, substance or another reactant called as RCL. So, this will facilitate the combination of R and CN. The 
product RCL is formed and now the tetra alkyl ammonium chloride will be regenerated. Again this will go and react with the sodium cyanide. The next reactant, the next reaction, next possible product formation, everything will be carried out. So this is the advantage of a phase transfer catalysis. And what is this R molecule? They say one chloro octane. And similarly the final product formed is one cyano octane. So phase transfer catalysis finds usefulness only when there are two different solvents, two different phases, there the linking is not possible. Those areas we can go for the phase transfer. Last area of today's discussion is uh, about nano catalysts. Nowadays, many of the people, chemists, are talking about uh, nano science. Yes. The particle size is very, 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 very small. So, the last topic is uh, nano catalysis. So, these nanoparticles may be metals or metal oxides. The main advantage of these catalysts are uh, they are very, very specific and they are successful both for homogeneous and for the heterogeneous catalysis reaction. Yes, since the size is very small, they can match very well. And uh, the another biggest advantage is 100% uh, product formation is possible. And the catalyst can be regenerated easily. That is the next uh, important application. Let us see one of the examples for this process. If we take lindane, lindane, the structure is like this. All the six positions, it has a chlorine. This is lindane. Linden goes for reduction, that means in the process of combination catalysts. Look at the charges of both iron and palladium, that is zero charge. And it reacts with the hydrogen molecule, you know, hydrochloric acid will be removed in all the six spaces uh, and hydrogen gets attached. Because of this, there is a formation of the cyclohexane and six molecules of hydrochloric acid. So, nano catalysts are very important in very specific selective reaction where we are looking for 100% product formation. And platinum. This is being done efficiently and cheaply by using all of the platinum and palladium possible. In this type of metallic catalysis, only the atoms on the surface that are exposed to a reaction are useful. By using nano-sized engineering, Selk and Woodfield are working on putting one nanometer crystals of these metals into the pores of the support, which allow for the efficient use of virtually every individual atom of these highly expensive materials. This makes the catalyst more effective at accomplishing its job and cheaper to produce because of the more efficient use of the materials. So dear students, today we have learned a lot about the special areas of the catalyst and catalysis. First one, we learned about enzyme catalysis, which are making a lot of changes inside our body. We learned about zeolite catalysis, and we learned about phase transfer catalysis. Finally, we learned about the nano catalysis. Next class, we'll be talking about a special area of collateral chemistry that is useful for us in every walk of life. 
Without catalysis, the world as we know it would not exist. Everything from digesting the food we eat to the refinement of gas for our cars requires catalysts. There is a large difference, however. Our bodies use enzymes as catalysts, while industry uses expensive noble metals. These expensive noble metal catalysts are not only used in the production of gasoline, they're also used in the catalytic converters of our cars to help them burn cleaner, in newer clean energy sources such as hydrogen fuel cells, in the manufacturing of foods such as margarine, and in the creation of life-saving medicines.